With tank and healer rankings out of the way, it's time to find out which class can pump the biggest numbers. In this video, we'll go over each of the melee DPS classes and compare which performs the best. Let me add a little bit of a disclaimer here. This will give you an overview of the entire expansion and the rankings may or may not be true for every single phase. Some classes will be strong at the start and then fall off, while others scale more heavily with gear from later phases. I'll also look to place more emphasis on the raw numbers than the buffs and the utility that they bring to the raid. Almost every spec will have a spot in a 25-man roster, but out of those specs, which will be the one you'll see towards the top of the rankings. And with that, let's start off with the class that I played on original release, namely the Frost Death Knight. The Frosty K finds himself in Cataclysm in a very similar situation as they did in Wrath of the Lich King. They'll be very strong with limited gear, but fall off compared to other classes as we reach full best in slot. While you'll find nothing new and crazy in the Frost DK toolkit, the way you play will change quite a bit from the Wrath version. The cooldown of Howling Blast has been removed and now only costs one Frost Rune. Additionally, with the new mastery system increasing frost damage, the way we use Howling Blast also changes significantly. There will be several playstyles that will be viable, like 200 frost as well as haste and crit spec with more focus on obliterate. But most likely we will see the master frost spec that will prioritize his mastery and haste while putting heavy emphasis on Howling Blast to come out on top. Especially during speedruns where there is a lot of added value on being able to pump higher numbers on trash. Frost Death Knights bring brittle bones and icy talents to the raid. Which is not a bad addition, but it will most likely be brought up by other classes as survival hunters, arms warriors, and combat rogues will most likely see high representation in the raids. But in a 10 man setting, a Frost Death Knight will definitely pull its weight in the buff department. Frost in Cataclysm will be very fun to play and will perform well in the early game. They'll have niche use cases and can perform extremely well on AoE. But their poor scaling and limited utility mean they lose out on a top rank while still earning a spot in the A tier. Moving on to the big brother, the unholy Death Knight. If you've been playing Frost in Raptor Lich King, then surely you've been eating the dust of this cooldown management beast of a spec. Every single patch, the unholy Death Knight has been one of the top dogs, with the exception of ICC once everyone got full best in slot. While some things about the unholy Death Knight will change, the fact that you'll be pumping the meters while leaving the Frost brethren in the dust remains the same. To me, the Unholy Death Knight really comes into its own in Cataclysm when it comes to class fantasy, leaning into the disease and pet management playstyle. The Unholy Death Knight gets Dark Transformation, which allows them to transform their pet into a proper aberration after getting 5 sacks of Shadow Infusion, which you get by casting Death Coils. They also get a spender for their Frost and Unholy runes in the form of Festering Strike, which extends the duration of your dots meaning you'll pretty much never have to cast Icy Touch and Plague Strike unless you have to swap targets while Outbreak is on cooldown. Unholy Frenzy gets swapped from the Blood Tree to the Unholy Tree, and instead of giving 20% damage increase, it now gives a 20% haste increase. Most people will opt to cast it on themselves, but do keep in mind that it does not stack with Heroism and that your Gargoyle is GCD capped in this expansion, so you'll need to be a bit more mindful about your cooldown usage than to just pop everything at once. Utility-wise, Unholy does not bring a whole lot to the table. The magic buff increase can be brought by several classes, and the anti-magical zone is not very useful outside of 10-man scenarios. But frankly, when you pump as hard as the Unholy BK does in Cataclysm, you don't need utility, which is why they earned their spot in the S tier. Working our way through the plate classes brings us to the Retribution Paladin. All Paladin specs in Cataclysm were reworked and their rotation became centered around the Builder slash Spender rotation of Holy Power instead of the cooldown based rotation of Wrath. If you enjoy the somewhat mindless rotation of Wrath, then Cataclysm Wrath may not be for you. In this expansion, it will be much more about managing uptime of your Inquisition buff, building Holy Power, using procs, and aligning your cooldowns during burst windows. The Red Paladin gets some wonderful quality of life additions in Cataclysm like Long Arm of the Law, giving you a 45% movement speed increase when you use Judgment at range and will be able to pull their weight in the Interrupt Department with the addition of Rebuke. The single target rotation is a lot more dynamic and will require you to make decisions about what to press next based on procs and buff durations, but the multi-target rotation, in my opinion, is clearly missing some oomph. You simply just use your single target rotation, as you have no AoE Holy Power Spender. If there's more than one target, you swap to Seal of Righteousness, and if there's more than four targets, you use Divine Storm instead of Crusader Strike. 
you still only cast Consecration if pretty much every single other rotational spell is on cooldown. The Red Paladin is much more consistent than in Wrath, and doesn't need a Shadowmoor equivalent to do competitive damage. Realistically, Red Paladins will be the class brought for the 3% damage increase raid buff while still providing kings or mites, making having one in a 25-man team absolutely essential and a strong competitor for a DPS spot in a 10-man group. This is why the Red Paladin earns her spot in the A tier. Next on the list, we have the Arms Warrior. The Arms Warrior in previous expansions have been relegated to the role of a PvP spec. But while it's still the go-to PvP spec in Cataclysm, it really comes into its own as a PvE spec as well. The Arms Warrior just says no when it comes to boss armor. With a new spell called Colossus Smash, your rotation becomes all about making the most out of the windows where the debuff is active. Properly using Inner Rage, Deadly Calm, and Stance Dancing correctly will set you apart from other warriors. You have strong cleave with sweeping strikes, strong AoE with bladestorm and rent spreading, and the single target speaks for itself. The only problem really with the Arms Warrior is that they don't bring any special buffs outside of the 4% physical damage buff that is also brought by Frosty Case and Combat Rogues. All other buffs will realistically be brought by your Blood DK tank and Feral Druid off tank. But in a 10-man scenario, without an optimized comp, the Arms Warrior absolutely does bring a lot to the table. But here's the thing. Who need buffs when you have damage? And that's why they earned their spot in the S tier. I will however make the disclaimer here that for both tier 11 and 12, they will be more of an A tier pick. But really starts to go crazy on the DPS after they get their best weapon in Firelands. But overall, they're an incredibly strong pick. That brings us on to the Fury Warrior. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Now, I think the internet is being a bit harsh on the Fury Warrior. It's ultimately a very similar state to previous expansions, where it'll be utter garbage towards the beginning of the expansion, but scale extremely well with gear, and once we get to Dragon Soul, you should not be surprised if you get out DPS on a lot of fights by a Fury Warrior. The mastery system was nerfed and then buffed again during the expansion, and seeing as we'll be playing on the 4.3.4 tuning, we should see Fury Warrior as a slightly stronger pick than it was the first time around. That being said, the reason why you'll probably see no Fury Warriors and why everyone is placing them as a bottom pick for this expansion simply comes down to the alternative being so much better. In the early phases, it won't even be close. And even in full biz, the Arms Warrior will pull ahead slightly of the Fury Warrior, so why would you ever play one? All that, combined with having less utility than the Arms Warrior, earns them a spot in the D tier. That brings us to the Enhancement Shaman. The reign of the spell hands is no more. The Enhancement Shaman is back to using agility once again. The excel at short term burst and consistent AoE fights with the ability to spread flame shock with Lava Lash. Combine that with the tried and true Magma Totem and Fire Nova, and you'll be doing big numbers. The problem for the Enhanced Shaman is that's where the pros list kind of end. As a Shaman this expansion, you'll mostly be relegated to being a utility pick. You have a wide set of buffs that will allow the raid to be more flexible with this composition, and with the 5 second interrupt cooldown, you will be the go-to person for the kick rotations. Not to mention that while mages now can cast time warp, you don't want to take away a global from those pumping fire mages, and rest of shaman will not be that widely represented. The role of casting lust will be yours to fill. With all that said, a good enhancement shaman can still do solid damage and with later phases bringing the opportunity for some solid snapshots and gear swapping, they won't merely be buff bots. That's why they earned their spot in the B tier. That brings us on to the Feral Druid. The Feral Druid in Cataclysm plays very similar to the Wrath of Lich King version, but with a few minor adjustments. It'll be all about managing the uptime of your Rake, Rip, and Savage Roar while snapshotting your bleeds with Tiger's Fury. Savage Roar was changed to being an auto-attack modifier, thus making it less crucial to have up before you bleed. You'll also have some procs to keep the gameplay somewhat dynamic in the form of Stampede, allowing you to use Ravage without being in stealth. Once the boss gets to 25%, you'll be able to refresh your rip through using Ferocious Bite, which makes your execute phase very strong. The rip used to go into the execute phase, we want to snapshot to the best of our ability in order to keep the same rip up for the remainder of the fight. Utility-wise, you bring Stampeding Roar, which is absolutely broken on some fights, while still pulling your weight buff-wise with 5% crit, 30% bleed damage, and Sunder Armor. Now, here's the harsh reality. As a Feral Druid off-tank, you're absolutely an S-tier pick. 
but if you aim to be a pure DPS, then Cataclysm will not be kind to you. Combat rest is not what it used to be after the changes in Cataclysm, and will certainly be brought by someone else in the raid group, whether you're doing 10-man or 25-man raiding. Your DPS is middle of the pack and can be strong in certain use cases. But unless you're an off-tank, then you're earning yourself a spot in the B tier. That brings us on to the Rogue, and frankly, this video is long enough without going over each of the individual specs in detail, so strap in and let's speedrun these specs. Buff-wise, none of the specs brings anything that isn't brought by other popular classes, and as such, you need to do big numbers to justify a raid spot. The Assassination Rogue does just that. With an incredibly simple playstyle of using Mutilate to build combo points and then Venom to spend them while maintaining Rapture, the Assassination Rogue will pump hard from the get-go. Ultimately, it plays very similarly to how it did in Wrath with the addition of Vendetta, and you now have an XQ phase where you swap to Backstab instead of Mutilate when the target is below 35% HP. Combat Rogue pretty much plays exactly like it did in Wrath with two major changes. In Cataclysm, you get access to Revealing Strikes, which is a combo point generating ability that empowers your next offensive finishing move, being Eviscerate or Rapture. You'll still be spamming Sinister Strike, but Revealing Strike should be used before you reach 5 combo points if you are offloading your points with a damaging spell. Then there's the big one. Blade Flurry gets turned to a Toggle On and Off ability, meaning if you choose to, you can have it up at all times. It does come with the trade-off of having 30% less energy regeneration when it's up, but boy oh boy does the Combat Rogue pump in fights where there's a lot of cleave. Then we have the Sub Rogue. In past expansions, the Sub Rogue has been the go-to PvP spec, and Cataclysm doesn't necessarily change that, but that being said, they are certainly viable in a PvE setting this time around. It's one of the hardest classes in the game to play right, and if you don't play the spec optimally, it falls behind the other two significantly. It will arguably be an S-tier spec when they get access to legendary daggers in Dragon Soul, but at that point, progression is already over, so it doesn't really matter. They could still see some uses over the Asa Rogue, but will for the most part not see much play in a competitive environment. And therefore, I will place the Asa Rogue in the A tier, Combat Rogue in B tier, and Sub Rogues in C tier. Now, keep in mind that the power levels throughout the patches will vary, and some classes will bounce up and down a tier or two, depending on the face. Further, Cataclysm is in my opinion where the balance is at its best, and with buffs being consolidated, all specs are pretty much equal. Some are just more equal than others. If you enjoyed this video, I'm sure you will enjoy the tank and healer rankings that I put out a while ago. I also have a Cataclysm playlist if you're on board that Cataclysm hype train. But that's all for now. Thank you very much for watching. Until next time.